Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Nusret Tash, and I'll be presenting Bitcoin Enhanced Proof of Stake Security, Possibilities and Impossibilities. Um, this is joint work with my advisor, David Che, Fang Yu Gai, Shiram Kanan, Mohammed Medali, and uh, Fisher Yu. Oops. Is there a direction I should be pointing this at? Oh, okay, perfect. So an important trend in the blockchain world is the shift from proof of work to proof of stake based civil resistance mechanisms as evidenced by Ethereum's recent merge. So proof of stake blockchains offer three main advantages over proof of work ones. They consume less energy. They can support faster confirmation and they can provide more accountability against adversarial validators. So now this concept of more accountability has been formalized into accountable safety. Accountable safety states that if there's a safety violation, a third of the validators can be provably identified as protocol violators, which means I can generate a proof identifying those as protocol violators. Note that this is a stronger property than providing safety when only less than a third of the validators are adversarial. Indeed, accountable safety does imply safety in this case. Now, how does accountable safety work? Let's consider a proof of stake blockchain where the blocks have been finalized by a quorum of signatures from a two third of the validator set. Now, suppose there was a safety violation and two different clients have seen two different uh, finalized chains. Now, in this case, these clients can come together and they can inspect the signatures on the conflicting blocks, identifying the one third validator set that has double signed these conflicting blocks, which is a protocol violation. Okay, so why are we trying so hard to go beyond traditional safety guarantees? The reason is that we would like to provide economic security. Because once you identify the adversarial validators, you can now impose financial punishments on them. Now, unfortunately, accountable safety falls short of achieving economic security in the context of proof of stake blockchains, where the stake might be evolving over time. As a result, we had to propose a strengthening of, of accountable safety called slashable safety. Now, slashable safety states that if there's a safety violation, a third of the adversarial validators, uh, sorry, a third of the validator set can be provably identified as protocol violators before they withdraw their stake, namely before they unbond. Now, this provides economic security for proof of stake blockchains because when adversarial validators are identified, they would still be staked in the system, so we can slash their stake. Now, unfortunately, although many proof of stake protocols such as Tendermint, Ethereum, etc., provide accountable safety, no POS protocol can have slashable safety without external trust. And the reason is the posterior corruption attacks, which are well known in the field. Now, let's consider the attack example from the previous slide, except that now the adversary validators, instead of immediately publishing the attack chain, they wait until they unbond on the canonical chain, and then they publish the attack chain. Now, if you're a client that has been observing the system over time, you would, you would be able to reject the attack chain. But for a late coming client, that is not an option, because a late coming client doesn't know which event happened at what point in, in time. Although this late coming client can identify the adversarial validators through the double signatures, now it cannot impose financial punishments on them because these validators have already unbonded. Okay, so how do we resolve this problem? Well, the answer is on the screen. We will need to use a reliable arrow of time. Namely, we will need a time stamping server that will help the late coming client distinguish between events that happened at different points in past. We propose using Bitcoin as a time stamping server backed by the Bitcoin's own white paper, which defines it as a peer to peer distributed time stamp server. However, Bitcoin has notoriously small block space, which makes it more, which makes it more correct to call it a data limited time stamping server. Now, this brings us to our architecture namely the Babylon architecture that consists of two components, a proof of stake chain that outputs a ledger and a data limited time stamping server, namely Bitcoin, that accepts succinct commitments from this proof of stake chain. They two together constitute the Babylon protocol, uh, which provides the following guarantees. It can achieve slashable safety resilience turn, 
and you can achieve liveness with resilience hub. Moreover, Babylon protocol has the optimal security guarantees that can be achieved by any proof of stake chain given access to a data limited timestamping server. Now contrasting this with the properties of a standalone proof of stake chain that is optimal, we see that the Babylon protocol upgrades the accountability guarantee to slashability and it upgrades the liveness from one third to one half thanks to the use of this uh, data limited timestamp server. Now let's see our protocol in action. So here we see the proof of stake chain that has received an unbonding request, a request to withdraw stake. Our proof of stake chain sends periodic timestamps to the data limited timestamping server named the Bitcoin. These timestamps consist of the hash of the block and a quorum of signatures. Now, once this timestamp becomes sufficiently deep in Bitcoin, namely some K deep, where K is a flexible parameter, the unbonding request is granted, the validators unbond. Now, at this point, if they choose to do a posterior corruption attack and publish an attack chain, the timestamp of the attack chain can only come after the timestamp of the blocks on the canonical chain. As a result, even a late coming client will be able to distinguish these two different chains. Moreover, now we, have, we, are able, we are able to reduce the unbonding time to be the same as the confirmation time of timestamps on Bitcoin. And uh, we will soon see how, what, what improvement this provides us with. OK, so when we were writing this paper, uh, we did experiments where we sent hourly timestamps, namely block hash and an aggregate BLS signature to stand for the quorum of signatures to Bitcoin via the OP return opcode. However, something very interesting has happened since we have done these experiments in the summer. So here we see the uh, average transaction fees of Bitcoin. And as you can see, there is a spike towards actually the time of this presentation. When we did our experiments, the average transaction fee was a uh, 0.9 US dollars, and the, which made the yearly cost of timestamping a mere 10K for a single POS chain. Now, if these transaction fees remain at these high levels, or if we see future spikes like this, then the average transaction fee could be as high as 31 US dollars, which makes the yearly cost as high as 360,000. Now, at this point, Bitcoin is even more data limited than we thought it was, which makes our succinct timestamps, even though they are succinct, not succinct enough. So, um, of course, people are not going to stop here. So, there has been uh, solutions developed in the industry. So, that I just want to show one. So here, people uh, are ag aggregating timestamps from different proof of stake blockchains within a blockchain and posting a single timestamp on behalf of them. Um, for, so in this context, they were able to reduce the total cost of uh, timestamping to Bitcoin from 8 million US dollars uh, for 23 blockchains to 360K, which is the same cost, which is the cost for a single blockchain. Moreover, another thing I would like to highlight here is that these blockchains are Cosmos zones, which have an unbonding delay of 21 days. And this uh, solution can reduce the unbonding delay from 21 days to, let's say, a matter of hours, uh, whatever your K is on Bitcoin. Uh, for K equals 100, it's 22 hours. Um, the, the reduction basically is enabled by using Bitcoin as the reliable arrow of time, as the time timestamping service, instead of some slow social consensus mechanism. All right, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Uh, questions, anyone? Yeah, Itai. Uh, hi, uh, Itai from Technion. Uh, th uh, thanks, this is, uh, this is great and uh, I guess uh, emphasizes the uh, importance of Bitcoin still to this day, despite some uh, doubts I've heard earlier today. Um, I, I, have, I have a question maybe preempting Brian here. Uh, how does this um, compare to work that was done, I don't know, uh, at least five years ago on uh, chains that use uh, proof of work in order to uh, reconfigure fast working chains of participants that can do a uh, quick uh, quick consensus like bizcoin and like hybrid consensus and bizcoin yeah um, so here in our architecture we are uh, using the bitcoin chain so in that in in those works 
I think they were having a proof of work selection mechanism for the validator set. So here we are using Bitcoin as it is. So Bitcoin doesn't really have to know what is going on under the POS chain. So we are using an existing chain um, for, for this purpose. In fact, our solution can use any data limited timestamping service. So if you have, let's say 20 years from now on, we have a very secure proof of space based blockchain that uh, has uh, as much security as people currently put to Bitcoin. If this happens, our solution would also work with that. Uh, and then this proof of space blockchain in 20 years from now on will not also have to know what is going on for that underlying proof of stake chain. So it's using an existing chain as it is. The reason we highlighted Bitcoin here was that because it's not vulnerable to these long range attacks by being a proof of work chain, that is why it made sense to use Bitcoin as this uh, upper, uh, overlay uh, secure blockchain. Thank you. Uh, great talk. Uh, Ruo Mu from National University of Singapore. So uh, my understanding is that by using Bitcoin as the timestamp server, the main benefit you get is, is this slashable, right? So uh, I want to ask how, how much security gain do you get from like, the blockchain being slashable to like, uh, malicious behavior? Because I would imagine uh, if I'm an attacker, I, I hold some stake and I successfully launch a double spending attack. Then what happens after that would be the price of this cryptocurrency will drop a lot. And in that sense, even without this slashable, I already lose a lot of money. Maybe almost all the value of my cryptocurrency. So, so in, is that understanding correct? And if that understanding is correct, how, how much security gain do you get from slashable? Yeah, so of course we he here had to do some, uh, had to make some assumptions because as you said, if I attack a chain, let's say, and somehow if I pull off my attack before people even notice the attack, afterwards, uh, and then like afterwards the value of the coin drops, I might not be losing much. So that's the rationale. But actually there is like a minor, I would like to say flow here, and it's the following. In order to do this attack, you need to acquire a third of the stake, right? Mm. But if the coin value already drops, you're saying that like slashing off my stake doesn't matter, but if the coin's value already dropped, you already lost your, the money you initially put into the system to acquire this one third of the stake. So you will still be losing the money that's equivalent to the one third of the stake before your attack in this case. Okay. And then now you are saying that, of course, if there are transactions that are more valuable on this chain, that is more valuable than the stake backing this chain, mm -hmm. your attack will still give a profit. But this already tells us that there is an upper bound on the, like, the, the value of the transactions you can support on a proof of stake chain. And this upper bound is the uh, level of stake on the proof of stake chain. Like, that should be a lesson to all like, proof of stake chains that you shouldn't try to support value um, more than your stake if you don't have borrow of trust from any external service. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no worries. Thanks. Uh, any other quick questions? Yeah. Hi, um, Ray from Technion. Um, what are the security assumptions you make on Bitcoin? Because I guess you said you need half uh, to have such a bit of safety, but it really depends on Bitcoin security. Yeah, great question. Actually, after Worldman talk, maybe we should, I should have reconsidered the example here as Bitcoin. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the assumption is we are assuming this data limited timestamping server is secure. So we are somehow assuming it has a, like, a secure, safe, and live total ordering property. The only constraint on it is it's data limited in the sense that you cannot post um, like data, suppose your data amount on the proof of stake chain is M, you cannot post more than like constant in M or logarithmic in M. So that's the, like the data limitedness assumption in our construction. And other than that, we do assume it's secure. Um, but um, you can strengthen the analysis here by getting rid of the security assumption. And suppose Bitcoin is, has somehow security that uh, increases as you make, make your K larger and larger. So now you can also achieve a trade-off between the latency of unbonding and the security you get from the, using this architecture. So that would also be possible. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, let's thank the speaker once more.